While I have seen medical cannabis bring improvements in many different conditions, some of the most impressive changes have been in people with autism. Now, there's a new study that shows that over 90% of people with autism showed improvement using different forms of CBD and THC when taking an individualized approach, which is what we do here. So let's talk about it. Hey everybody, it's Dr. David. I'm a board certified pediatrician in Tampa, Florida, focusing on functional medicine. I'm also one of the original physicians in the state to be certified to authorize medical cannabis for patients and one of the few pediatricians. And I have a tremendous amount of knowledge when dealing with especially people with autism. So I also have been taking care of people with autism for almost 25 years, taking a functional medicine approach, dietary approaches, nutritional approaches, detoxification approaches, and also being the per- one of the very beginning do- doctors using medical cannabis. You know, it goes way back. And certainly many of my patients have been people with autism for the use of medical cannabis. Now, I have seen many, many improvements in people with autism when they've used medical cannabis. Some of them include improvements in sleep, whether it's sleeping through the night, getting them to sleep better, lower irritability, make them more functional, more pleasant to be around, more comfortable in their own skins for themselves, more calm overall, just like a chill aspect of things that they can really settle in and feel comfortable about things, lower anxiety, being able to make it through their day without being just so anxious that they almost can't function because sometimes it can paralyze them, um, a lowering of seizures, although not part of the autism diagnosis, especially after um, people enter their um, puberty years, that seizures are a very common comorbidity. And we've seen amazing things for people with autism and their seizures. We've seen better social skills. That's one of the things that cannabis does is it improves people's social skills, makes them feel more comfortable around other people, more social, more engaging with people. Um, Improving communication. Um, I've seen lots of benefits in terms of them following people, following directions better, um, taking guidance better. But I've also seen some people show significant improvements in their verbal communication, their ability to sleep as well. Um, Also, one of the nice side effects, as you will, is that it lowers the it can often lower the tension in the entire household. Obviously, if there is a kid who's struggling or or, or a young adult who's struggling with autism and they um, are irritable all the time, that can really take a toll on the entire family, on the siblings. Um, for the parents, their relationship between the parents, etc. Um, and so that can be really helpful. I've seen families on the brink of separating because it, it was so stressful for their kids or that they were ready to put their kids into a group home because they couldn't handle them anymore. And so it's, you know, absolutely cannabis has kept families together, kept them at home. And that's just a truly remarkable thing. Now, before we get into this new study, which I read that recently came out that was really quite impressive, just a basic understanding, I haven't explained it in a little while, about how cannabis works in the body. And for those who don't know, we all make endocannabinoids, one that's called 2-AG, one that's called anandamide. We all have cannabinoid receptors throughout our bodies, and in fact, Receptors are found and cannabinoids are found in all mammals, many, um, all vertebrates and even sub sub vertebrates. So this is a absolute part of animal um, metabolism, including for humans. Okay, so what happens is, and this is especially true on nerve cells, pain cells, inflammatory cells. So this is what we refer to as what we call a retrograde or going in the opposite direction. So most things in our nerve pathways, pain pathways, one cell is sending a signal to the other cell, a neurotransmitter that stimulates this one and, and then an action happens down the, down the, down the nerve. In the, the endocannabinoid, so it's, you could think of it as the master regulator of our bodies. It creates homeostasis, balance in the body. So if one cell is over-firing and over-stimulating this cell too much, this cell sends an endocannabinoid back to this cell, basically saying, hey, chill out. And so and those, those um, endocannabinoids are instantaneously made, and then they are instantaneously or close instantaneously destroyed um, in the synapse once it does its thing. Okay, now... What CBD does is it slows the breakdown of those um, endocannabinoids in the system, keeping them around longer, therefore better able to stimulate the other cell. THC itself predominantly works by stimulating those same receptors directly. 
CBD can do them too, and there's a lot more to it than that. But that's just the basic idea. And you may have heard me use the analogy that um, it's kind of like you need to take a kid bowling. And, you know, when we bowl, if we go too far left, too far right, we're in the gutter. But when the kids put the rails up, they're able to keep the ball balance back moving it back towards the center and the higher that you can make those rails if you throw a really bad ball the more likely you're going to keep it in and so that's what you know the cbd the thc is doing is it's keeping the ability of those cells to maintain the signal in a much more balanced way despite some very bad things potentially coming about in, the, in that individual's um, body or in their environment okay so back in 2019 and the 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 show the uh the study you can see the link in the show notes below in the description they found that people with autism had lower levels of circulating of those endocannabinoids 2ag and to and and anatomide than people without um without autism and so it seems to me that what may be happening in people with autism and why this can be successful is that that cannabis, medical cannabis, is actually treating a deficiency, just like we would treat vitamin D deficiency or, or zinc deficiency. This is how we treat it. Now, in terms of this new study, so there were 20 subjects, 20 people with autism. Most of them were male, which makes sense because there's about a four to one, five to one ratio. Um, they were a wide range between four years old and 38 years of old. And what they did is they did an individualized approach. And I was so happy to see them do this because since day one, this is how I've educated people. You start off with a very low dose of CBD. Usually it's a dose that's not even going to make a difference. You gradually work it up to a point where you, over time, you get to see what the benefit is. And if you're happy with the benefits, then you stay there. If not, then you add the THC in. And so they then brought the THC in and then they just found the right balance. And, you know, some people had, you know, a very close to even balance. Some people were much higher in the CBD, but it was an individualized approach. They documented every step of the way. They kept spreadsheets so that they can figure out what was best for them. And that is what... I just found so amazing because so many of the research studies that I see out there, they give everybody 10 milligrams or they did something like that, but everybody's different, right? I've never seen two people with autism the same. So you'd have to figure that their treatments may not be all the same either. And that was just, it was so lovely to see that. Okay. So what they actually found is that they ended up ranging the, the best um, ratio was anywhere from 49 parts CBD to one part THC to three parts CBD to one part THC. So obviously you can see that's a very, very big difference, but it's whatever they landed on. And then they kept them on that regimen for about, um, for at least three months, sometimes up to six months. And then after, so, but the findings that I'm going to present to you are the findings that were, that were released at, um, or that were collected, I should say, after the three months were over the first three months. Okay. So overall, the quality of life for people with autism improved 95% of the time, 95. So that's 19 out of those 20 subjects, okay? Now the families themselves, coming back to what we were talking about before, the families themselves, 83% of the family members said that their lives were better, that their family was better because of this treatment, again, for the reasons why I stated before. But in terms of the individual improvements, and this is where it just it knocks it out of the park. So in terms of improvement in communication skills, 85% of the individuals had improved receptive skills, um, ability to follow directions, that their understanding was better. 75% had improvement in eye contact and attention to conversation when somebody's talking to them in terms of making eye contact, paying attention to what's going on, 75%. 50% of, of the individuals had improvements in their actual speech, their ability to communicate improved. Okay, 57% showed improvements in their cognitive um, um, function, their intellectual ability as well. Now, um, in addition to that, the caregivers reported some improvements in some of those comorbidities, the things that are not necessarily the core symptoms of autism, but certainly seen in people with autism, such as seizures. 84% of the patients who had seizures showed improvement. Um, emotional meltdowns, there was a reduce of 76%. I'm sorry, 76% of people have had improvement. Um, discomfort in noisy or crowded places, places um, 72%. Aggression towards others, um, 68%. Um, eating non-food items, you know, pica, the eating of non-food items, 63% um, improvement to people who are having those symptoms. Um, making screams and, ra and random noises, 54% of them improved. Now, to be clear, 
not everybody did well, okay? Um, as, of course, if, it, if, if you ever see a study that 100% of people did well, I would really question that study. But um, some did show specific worsening in symptoms, such as some of them actually were making worse eye contact. Um, they had lower ability to um, to um, for um, attention towards communi- for people talking to them or increased meltdowns. Two of the 20... Um, report reported that they were experiencing an overall worsening of symptoms. So those things that I mentioned before, there were some things that were better, some things that were um, worse, but there was a net overall improvement of 90%. But in the other two, they said that there was a net negative when taking everything into account. Okay. So now in terms of the study itself, I do want to point out that there were some limitations. First of all, there were only 20 people. Obviously, we like to see studies that are larger than this, but still it's what we have. And it was impressive. It was well done. But I also acknowledge that it was a not a double-blinded placebo control type of study. So it was reporting with everybody knowing what they were taking. And obviously the placebo effect can come into play um, when, when, when somebody um, knows what they're doing or even thinks that they know what they're doing, which is kind of interesting how why people with placebo often do get better as well. So what's my take on the whole thing? First and foremost, as I've seen over the years, confirmed by this, medical marijuana, medical cannabis can be an incredibly effective treatment for a large number of people with autism. Um, now, and the other thing is, though, is like taking this individualized approach, working with a physician who understands how to increase milligrams. Now, I'm not going to increase milligrams, say, of THC, especially on a four-year-old the way I would for, an, for a young adult. Just very, very difficult how much I'm going to start with, what kind of jumping I'm going to be able to do, et cetera. So you really, you know, you have to work with somebody. You have to know what you're doing here in in order to make this successful. Okay. Now, of course, um, for those who are in Florida and anybody who wishes to be a patient of mine where I can actually be the um, ordering physician for them, um, that's what our holistic relief um, practice is. Thankfully, now the new law allows for telehealth after the first visit. So I've been having a lot of patients who come in from all over the state, recognizing they only have to make the drive the drive once. Um, it used to be that they had to make the drive every seven months. And, they, and while people still did it, it was definitely... Um, a hindrance to their life and sometimes not even safe. Imagine having somebody with seizures and you're driving across Alligator Alley where you're hour, hour and a half away from any kind of civilization. So thankfully for that. But also for those, um, as you may know, I my Dr. David MD patient education consultation business for people who are not in the state of Florida who will not be um, making an actual doctor-patient relationship. I can still serve as an educational consultant, um, and you can hit us up um, if you want to do that. And that way I can talk you through the individualized approach and how best to manage it, monitor it, etc. And, of course, if you like what you hear, please subscribe to this channel. Share it with other people. Um, very helpful. And, of course, um, if you really are inspired to um, become a Patreon member of ours, we really do appreciate the financial support people get there. And we do put additional information there. We release videos early there. It's kind of give you a, f- a few perks as well as a beautiful coffee mug. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope you guys have a great day and you learn something. Bye-bye.